All right. So, oh gosh, is my mic correct? Is my cam correct? Is my speaker? Yes. Uh, hi everyone. This is Melanie, uh, co-host of RPH. I'm here with Elena. Uh, we're both calling from where we normally do. I was going to get into it. (laughs) (laughs) We haven't moved recently. (laughs) We're, we're still in the same place. But right before I hit record, and the reason why I hit record is because we both took a break to come back before hitting record. And uh, Elena, you were saying that you're making a lamb stew and you went out there and it just like smelled so good. Yep. Okay. I started, so I, I started this morning, um, you know, I'm a big crock pot person mm-hmm. and uh, got some lamb, some roasted corn from this year's oh. roasted corn and uh, some green chili from this year's green chili. And some potatoes and onions and garlic just threw it in a big pot. And uh, it's just now beginning to like, the scent is beginning to flower. So the whole kitchen smells like lambs too. It's really good. And I got some Pueblo bread. So that's dinner tonight. Oh my God. Okay. I know we do like... You know, we like review movies and we do like these this anti-talk and like hardcore political analysis. But But okay. Elena... <laughs> makes the best fucking stews in the world. I'm just, I'm telling you, I have had Elena stews on more than one occasion. The way that she just described like the smell of the stew. I know, I know what that is. And I'm like, I'm very jealous. <laughs> and it's, it's very, I, I learned it all from my aunties on the Pueblo, mm-hmm. except the, the lamb of course was from the Navajo side of the family because, oh, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's a very Navajo dish. <laughs> um, and uh, because we, we have to be, we have to include everyone in the family. Sometimes I want to just hit it hard with like red chili stew, but sometimes <laughs> it's like, nope, got to feed the Navajo side of our <laughs> souls this week. So it's Navajo lamb stew and Pueblo bread. Wow. Yeah. Just always having to compromise your, your well, it's, it's all good. It's, it's, it's all good. And, and I, you know, I actually like when it starts getting cold because then you feel like, oh, this is, this is the time to make all these stews. Even though we, eat, we on the Pueblos eat stew year round, every feast True. day, it's always all stew all the time. But mm-hmm. in the winter, it always feels really good because you're warming up. Um, You don't have the windows open. So the, the scent stays in the house and yeah. And it gets like steamy. There's like oh, condensation yeah. on the windows. I don't know. It's like, yep. So, uh, I just wrote down all stew all the time. That should be the <laughs> title of this. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I love winter. So I'm, I'm, I like winter because, well, first of all, I'm a winter person, but, um, that's my affiliation in, in Oke um, but also because it's just, um, it's a quiet time. And I think mm-hmm. that we need this quiet time and it's a time to sort of reflect and, and be, um, and listen and be just rejuvenate, re-energize. And so I'm always ready for it at the end of October, early November, I'm always ready to, to sort of fall into that winter slumber kind of just be quiet. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, stew is like the perfect trends. It's like, it marks the transition to winter, like eating stews, drinking tea, been drinking a lot of hot tea. And I feel like, um, so this, so what we're going to talk about today on this podcast episode, it's what Sunday, November 13th. Uh, Elena and I were like, <laughs> we wanted to originally talk about something uplifting. <laughs> it is, uh, maybe, maybe we'll be able to get there on this episode, but we kind of landed on, why don't we just do kind of an open reflection on the week or the last 10 days? A lot has happened, um, pertaining to ind- indigenous politics or just like other things that are like very important. I think that have happened this week, elections and ICWA being heard before SCOTUS and things like that. Uh, and so we were like, why don't we just do a reflection? And I think my first reflection, which might actually be more hopeful, you know, and upbeat 
which is why I wanted to start out talking about stew before we talked about all the shitty things <laughs> that have transpired this week, is that I feel like this week, even here in Manishota Makoche, it really, the, the true transition to winter happened this week. Um, I don't know if it was like related to like the lunar eclipse and all of the stuff around there. It was like things came to a culmination at the beginning of the week and were like really wild and unstable and like overwhelming. And literally now things have just kind of like come back down and like the calmness has set in, like the calmness of winter. And I feel like that literally has all happened within the past seven to eight days here. And it also got cold on Thursday. It was like almost 70 degrees here and humid. And everyone was like, what the fuck? Like, this is so weird. Two hours later, the temp had dropped down to like in the 30s, felt like it was in the teens because of the wind chill. And by the time it was nightfall, it was snowing here. So within one day, yeah, climate change, but then one day, it was literally like, oh, winter started. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then after that, like as the weekend has progressed, it's been increasingly less overwhelming and intense and kind of like an everything everywhere all at once feeling. And I think the calmness is setting in and thank goodness we're recording this now and not like three days ago because where I was three days ago was just like madness, actually. So, stew. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, it's been, it has been, I mean, there's been so much going on and I mean, the elections, the, the American elections and um, not, I don't, really engage in American politics, mm -hmm. but, um, at the same time, I do pay attention to it because it's important and particularly around the issue of, um, abortion care. And we did that episode a few months back with, um, a Cole. Cole and, um, Jen? It was Jen, I think, maybe, or was, was it Kylie? Kylie? Might've been okay. Kylie. Um, and talked about how crucial that is for native women, um, but also all women of color and particularly poor women to have access to abortion care. And the fact that New Mexico um, went entirely blue um, and that the governor, um, Michelle Lujan Grisham is going to try, this was the headline in the, in the paper, try and codify abortion rights for women is actually really good news. And if it's something that they can do, it would be great because we do have a high percentage of indigenous and poor women of color who need access. And Cole um, works for one of the organizations that provides that access, um, Indigenous Women Rising, which is, is you know, it, that's crucial care for women. And because we're sandwiched in um, between Arizona and Texas. Mm -hmm. ugh, God. A lot of people have to travel to New Mexico to get abortion yeah. care. So it's critically important. Like New Mexico supports that enti the entire borderlands region at this point, actually, yeah. which is yeah. yeah, primarily indigenous women and like migrant women um, and women of color who need access. Mm -hmm. So it's that that was that was some good news. That was sort of a sigh of relief yeah. um, on in New Mexico um, for all women and particularly indigenous women and poor women of color. So that was some good news. That was something that was, you know, I don't know that I would say it was uplifting as much. It was just as, as it was just like a relief. Yeah. Like you don't have a crazy, like misogynist fascist. <laughs> this is the governor. We don't have New a Mexico. fucking weatherman. I mean, that's who we, I'm sorry, oh, but like, that's who we, was, was a fucking weatherman. <laughs> just and, a moron. <laughs> A moron, a liar, and, and you know, a super, yeah, misogynistic, um, you know, heavy, hardcore Christian, Republican, conservative, just a shit ass. You know, your run of the mill white <laughs> shit ass man, hetero, blah, hetero. Okay, All I gotta stop. All the things that are bad. All the things that are bad. <laughs> just a And he was a white man. <laughs> and he was a weatherman. And he was always wrong when he was a weatherman. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a bad weatherman, too. <laughs> so much wow, we're now now we're just gonna be labeled as like anti weatherman. <laughs> In addition to like all the other things people call us. <laughs> Oh, good. 
you made me you made me snort i think that's the first <laughs> snort i have ever issued on red power hour elena i was it was historic uh yeah i mean um here in minnesota really for the most part good results as well avoiding and and across you know the so-called united states like I, I was reading an ap report uh this morning about kind of like reflecting on the results from the election of, of course like georgia is still um, up for grabs but the dems maintained power majority in the senate right um yeah. i think the race is in arizona and nevada were very crucial for that um of course there was intense repression particularly of like the native vote in Arizona, probably for that very reason, that Arizona was going to be a very important swing state. Um, but voters who were polled, and you never know the accuracy of polls, but like the top three issues that were on people's minds as they were entering into these midterm elections, the first one was inflation, right? It was the economy. Um, the second one was <laughs> the... Uh, the fate of our democracy, <laughs> right? like, um, you know, like all of the Trump supported and the Trump backed candidates, people, I guess, being very concerned about, you know, like the anti-democratic, uh, openly, you know, fascistic <laughs> um, turn of those people. And their like utter lack of experience, I guess, was something that a lot of people were concerned about. And the third one was abortion or like reproductive rights and women's rights. Um, and so it would seem that the results are very much like Again, this is kind of like what it's like being in the United States. I really, I, I, you know, I was telling um, a comrade of ours from Mexico who was visiting this week, um, a Red Nation comrade who lives in Mexico City. I was like, man, if I weren't indigenous to this place, I would fucking leave the United States. This country sucks. And like, I think the elections just demonstrate, you know, people aren't voting for Democrats. It's not like we're like excited, you know, that Michelle Lujan Grisham is in power. It's literally, literally just trying to like stop, you know, rabid misogynists and fascists, um, yep. you know, from having more power than they already do. And they already have a great deal of power. And honestly, like liberals and the Democratic Party has been like incredibly ineffective actually at fighting fascism because um, of the way liberalism operates in the United States. And so it's a rough time. It's a rough time to be a woman in this country. It's scary. You know, my, Maida and I, um, my comrade I'm talking about, we went to go see Wakanda Forever on Thursday. And as we were coming out of the movie, um, there was this like very, this like militarized security guard. He looked like a private security contractor from like Halliburton, like really? And he was standing right at the entrance to the movie theater, but like between the movie theater and the actual like room that we were in watching Wakanda forever. And we were both like incredibly taken aback, like the fuck? Cause he reminded me actually of like the armed militia dudes who were trying to kill us <laughs> in 2020 during the, the uprising. But I was thinking like, oh, that he's here because of like the very real potential of a mass shooting happening, particularly I think at movie premieres where there's like large crowds for this particular movie, right? And Maida was like, oh, I didn't even think about a mass shooting. I was like, well, that's because you don't have to live in the United States. Like yeah. literally from the moment that she was like, hey, we should go see this movie. I was like, oh God, I hope tonight isn't the, the night. I hope tonight isn't the night where I just happen to be in the movie theater where some fucking like white dude comes in and just starts shooting people, you know, yeah. or like, I hope today isn't the day that I go into the grocery store where it's like pretty much all people of color. Cause I live in a very diverse neighborhood in the twin cities, where like some crazy, like fascist comes in and just starts shooting people, you know? Um, so all I'm saying is that like the, the, the elections and like the, the real, you know, the real feelings I think people have about how scary it is to live in the United States right now, it's probably why people didn't vote for more fascists. I think people are really scared and just like suffering greatly because of inflation and like people, the lack of people housing should be as well. Scared. I mean, it, you know, I, I don't remember growing up going into a movie theater or a grocery store or any, you know, large building and immediately making sure I knew where the exits were. Yeah. And I do that as a matter of routine. Now Same. I go into a movie theater. I, Cause I also went to see Wakanda forever and just like spoiler, we're going to do a podcast 
on, oh, on it, yeah. but we no. have to process because it was, it really, was bad. It was really bad. It was bad. shockingly, um, it's heartbreaking <clears throat> actually yeah. the way that that movie represents and portrays indigenous people. It's really racist. <laughs> I literally got home from that movie and texted Melanie and said, just went to see Wakanda forever. Ouch. Like it yeah. hurt. It was painful. Yeah. Um, no, I felt like a punch in the gut, a knife to the heart kind of. Yep. I've talked to a lot of other indigenous comrades and they were like, pretty much all of us were just kind of like in shock because we were all really excited <laughs> about the movie. And then many of us had to like, um, we, all, we all wanted to walk out of the movie. Actually, it was that bad. And no one's talked about this yet. I know it's no. new. I know it only came out like what, four days ago? Or whatever, but but the yeah. reviews are all good, and I just I actually looked at the reviews to see if anyone had picked up on what I picked up on and what Melanie and Myra picked up on. And I mean, I I haven't seen any reviews like that, so we will we will yeah it's... give our reviews. Many races, particularly at the top of the ticket, remain too close to call right now as Maricopa County election workers continue processing ballots all weekend. So the latest batch, around 85,000, dropped tonight around 6 o'clock. They show Republican candidate for governor, Carrie Lake, cutting into Democrat Katie Hobbs' lead, but not by much. As our political reporter Mark Phillips discovered, most of today's votes counted are from Arizonans who dropped off their ballot, and this was on Election Day. Um, all I know mostly is about Arizona and how like profoundly racist, <laughs> you know, like the campaigning to uh, uh, and the amount of money that went into suppressing the native vote to make sure that that state turned red. It's already red. I don't know. Arizona is like a very conservative place. This is scary. It's a very white supremacist, not just like the Joe Arpaios of the world. And folks remember that moment like a decade ago. But also like in Northern Arizona, um, I grew up in a place called Kingman. I was born in a place called Kingman, Arizona, which is in like the Northwest part of the state. Um, and so that entire portion of the state and then kind of like all of the communities um, and counties kind of surrounding the Navajo Nation, there's like actual militia compounds in those places. And like people who, you know, just drive around with like Confederate flags on their trucks. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a real, it's like an actual battleground state. Um, I think because of the extremely, extremely white supremacist aspects of conservatism. Um, and then you also have like the Barry Goldwater kind of run of the mill kind of 60s conservatives, the like middle of the road Republicans who are also like racist, but I don't know. They don't wave Confederate flags. <laughs> the, the hidden were the crypto, the crypto racists. The crypto oh. racists. Aha, that's a good term. Yeah, the, the Arizona is, 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 is scary. And um, you know, the fact that it has, you know, more reservation land, I'm not going to say more native land because it's all native land and everywhere is native land, but, but in terms of actual federally, um, instituted reservation, Arizona has the most. And so you have the Navajo nation and then you have the Hopi and then you have the autumn people in the South and everywhere you go, you're close to, um, a reservation and it's for some reason that has created this this horrible white supremacy um supremacist and it's scary i find it scary to drive in arizona oh yeah i arizona and like when you're on i-40 going into california so you're going through like needles and barstow before you hit san bernardino and, and cruise into la like just don't get out of your car you That's know where horror movies are made like yeah, the bathrooms at some of those rest stops, that's where the chainsaw guy is and the guy with the axe. Yeah, Just no, saying. it's the, I, I have, you know, many of my closest um, Diné relatives on my dad's side still live in Kingman or like in some of those towns between like Kingman and Flagstaff. And I, I, we left a long time ago. My family did, but that place is like, creepy it's like scary i i don't know how they continue to survive there um because kingman i mean most people probably don't think about kingman arizona as anything which is totally fine you know you hit kingman and then you're at the california border relatively quickly but like the wallapai nation is right adjacent to kingman and so kingman is a border town 
as much as it is just kind of like its own place or whatever that was close to um, Southern California Edison Power Plant, which is right along the river in Lake Havasu, Nevada, which is right across. So Cayman's very close to the Nevada border too. And so um, it has all of the same problems, right? With like really extreme white supremacy um, that usually is inf inflected through anti-Indianism as any other reservation border towns, which of course, like we write about in Red Nation Rising. And so, um, so yeah, it's a scary place. And I think it's very indicative um, kind of of like, or like it's exemplary, I would say, of what Arizona is like. I would say Arizona is like, because of the, the, the racial, the particular history of racialization and like white power that was built in Phoenix in the post-war era. And then those kinds of places around resource extraction, Arizona is a much scarier place to be indigenous than New Mexico. And that's saying something. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it, it really it really is. They're very different geopolitical contexts. Um, yeah, they really are. And in in the New Mexico, like, well, when I think of Kingman and that area up up there, especially when you start going over into Nevada, there's a lot of turquoise up there, and so there's a lot of of um, extractive. Well, there's just there's extractive industries for for everything. But I think when I think of Kingman and in that part of Nevada, I always think of turquoise. Which, um, which is was one of the big big businesses out that way. Um, oh, New Mexico! I, was, I, I had to drive to Mountain Air a couple of weeks ago, and I never went to I, Mountain Air when I lived in New Mexico. You haven't missed anything. Um, <laughs> literally, like, and and I'm sorry for people who live in the southern part of the state. Like, once you cross I-40, with the exception of, of Albuquerque and like Isleta Pueblo, so once you cross I-40, um, south of I-40, that's all Texas. Like that's- It's, it's scary. It's Texas. And I was meeting someone down there. And um, so I crossed I-40, going through Moriarty and <laughs> Estancia. And it's just like flat. There's no mountains. I'm totally out of my element. I don't like it. I'm driving. You know, the last time I had to go down that road, I got pulled over um, by a cop because I was speeding. There were no signs anywhere, but I just, whatever, paid the ticket, moved on. Um, but this time I was supposed to meet someone in front of the dollar store and it was there were two stores in Mountain Air. One was a dollar store and one was a dollar general. And they were right across from each other. And I'm like, whoa, this is weird. There was no other businesses around. Like, I didn't see any banks. I didn't see any grocery stores. There were two dollar stores mm -hmm. right across from each other. And I was thinking, this is really scary. This is also like a horror movie waiting to happen with the the monster coming from either dollar general or dollar family dollar and, you know, fighting each other. But it's, yeah. So, you know, Santa Fe and, and North Albuquerque and North. So Albuquerque is different than Santa Fe. Santa Fe is like Mordor. Albuquerque has a little bit more sense, but anytime, you know, you go North of, of Albuquerque, you're getting in into, into real, um, or Albuquerque and North is where, 70% of the people in New Mexico live and it tends to be very liberal, um, very blue, very democratic. And then you go South and it's all, it's all uh, ranch land and, um, and resource extraction and resource like, extraction, like just Texas. Yeah. It's Texas. Oh God. Tell Carl's man campy. Oh. It, and it's not to say that like McKinley <clears throat> County isn't that way. And, um, uh, is it Rio Puerco County, the it, up in the four corners towards like Farmington yep. and Shiprock? But maybe I need to revise what I said. Arizona has a particular flavor of white supremacy that makes it very dangerous to be indigenous um, in that state. But I would say that like Southern New Mexico is very similar because yep. you're kind of entering into like the Texas approach to white supremacy and like the hatred of women. <laughs> like that Texan conservatism that is like, scary yep it's like it's just scary like southern new mexico you're right is very white it's very white it's very, um, very right, rural white rural conservative and so while while the rest of new mexico is electing 
uh, re-electing a female governor um, and um, a lot of um, Democratic um, representatives. Hobbs, which is yeah. really close to Texas, uh-huh. um, the city of Hobbs um, outlawed abortion. Oh my God. So I didn't know that. Oh yeah, it was it. it <laughs> And it's the closest place to Texas. So Hobbs is, I mean, Hobbs is like um, showing off to Texas. See, you can't get an abortion here either, even though you cross into New Mexico. Um, It's just, it's really, it's, it's a really horrific little place down there. But anyway, don't go south of Albuquerque. It's, (laughs) it's like, um, like in a horror movie when you say, please don't go down into the basement. Please don't go down into the basement. That's what Southern New Mexico is like. And also, right, like, we can't deny the fact that the, oh my God, like, the scary militarization and, like, the extreme profiling and surveillance that happens at the U.S.-Mexico border was, like, it's, it's like, a it is a sight to behold, and it is very, very draconian, actually, Um, whether you're in Arizona or you're in Texas or you're in New Mexico, and so we've never really talked much about that. And I mean, the Red Nation has never really done much organizing. There was a time um, right during the early parts of Trump's presidency, was it 2017 into 2018, when people were being very active. Um, many people were arrested along the border um, yeah. where New Mexico meets Mexico for protesting, right, the, the caging of children, uh, migrant children, mm-hmm. many of whom, many of whom were indigenous um, from Central America and parts of Mexico at the time. Um, but the I, I would f- I feel like in Red Nation, definitely some of our comrades went down south on a number of occasions to participate in direct actions and worked in coalition um, when that was kind of at the height of mobilization. But yeah, like Red Nation has never been like been had a strong presence in southern New Mexico, but that's it's also just because that's a scary place. Um, how do you, I don't know how to do that kind of organizing down there. So, yeah, it is scary. And you have to, I mean, I, last time I was that far South, I did go down to Carlsbad and there was a checkpoint that Mm -hmm. you had to go through right, right outside of, I think it was Alamogordo. Yeah. Um, I've been through that checkpoint. I, I mean, that to me is just offensive and fascist and everything else you could possibly call it, but God, It is like, um, I did this whole research project on fracking, um, like the colonial, uh, like the colonial geopolitics of fracking in New Mexico. And most of like what we focus on in the organization and what our comrade Cheyenne Antonio, who's from Eastern Navajo, who's who's from like a frontline community that's affected by the fracking revolution that has happened in the state in the past 10 to 15 years, is that actually the number of rigs Um, are much higher in southeastern New Mexico. So it's like basically the southeast corner and then like the northwest corner of the state that are completely overrun and pretty much like irreversibly damaged by oil and gas um, development, particularly fracking. And so, and obviously like the, the Permian Basin, which is in the southeast part of the state, goes down into Texas. Borders are kind of irrelevant. It's just like a large oil shale. It's one of the largest um, next to the Bakken, which is in North Dakota area in um in the united states and so a a lot of like what has happened in southeastern new mexico is like very similar actually to what's happened in the northwestern part of the state where there's just been a lot more mobilization around the protection of chaco canyon and like anti-colonial resistance from primarily native women and navajo community members um just because of like that's more, more adjacent to tribal communities but yeah, I don't really, you know, we've never organized in the southeast part of the state. But again, that's like, a, it's a, it's scary. It's a very scary, very white supremacist right wing. It's very place. scary. And it's, it's, um, I don't, I am not comfortable anywhere south of Albuquerque. Really, yeah, I mean, honest. that's, that's real. And that's I feel, real. I feel like I, like last time I had to drive down that way, um, I-25 south and you pass by the uh, the Alamo, not the not that Alamo, the Alamo um, Navajo Nation, and I don't know really a lot of people from that area, but I just like 
I feel so bad. Like, what are you all doing down here? Yeah, I feel bad for bad. them too. Super yeah. isolated. Yep. I feel bad for the mescaleros. Um, yeah, I feel I've, I've, we've had comrades who live in Las Cruces and like El Paso before. And <laughs> like, it's not that far really from Albuquerque to go to those places, but I like never visited them. Cause I was just like, i sorry. I just can't hang. I can't hang you guys. Like, nope. yeah. Well, I think that um, reflecting on white supremacy in New Mexico and, you know, I, I don't live in New Mexico anymore. I didn't grow up in New Mexico. You know, I spent my 30s, my late 20s and my 30s living in New Mexico, did my graduate work, formed the Red Nation. You know, like New Mexico has really influenced the, like the, the, pol the racial and like the colonial politics of New Mexico have really influenced my political development and just, you know, who I am as a person. But being here now in Minnesota, um, reflecting on the week. So on Friday night, so the National Women's Studies Association, which is the largest kind of feminist and queer studies association in the country, and I think the world, had their annual conference in Minneapolis, in downtown Minneapolis this week. Um, I think today might be the last day. And uh, they completely failed to include local organizers um, on the agenda, but after a series of missteps and mistakes, created a few sessions that were free to the public, but also for conference goers um, on Friday night. Unfortunately, they were all at the same time. So it was basically um, giving a platform to like grassroots black women organizers and then grassroots indigenous women organizers doing incredible work um, in the Twin Cities and in like the larger state of Minnesota about things. And I could only attend two of them because they, like I said, they were all happening at the same time, which is like a poor reflection of the conference committee organizers, but um, the first session was led by three uh, incredible Black women who are doing work on maintaining the protest at George Floyd Memorial Square, which is at 38th in Chicago and South Minneapolis. And, uh, you know, listening to them talk, and then after that session, there was a session of three Indigenous women, um, I think all of whom were Anishinaabeg, one was also Dakota and Anishinaabeg who are doing um, very in-depth community-based research for something called the Truth Commission, uh, which is towards recognition and university tribal healing, i.e. truth. Um, and the Truth Commission really came out of indigenous nations, the, the 11 indigenous nations that are current within the current boundaries of the state of Minnesota. Um, the tribal leadership got together uh, and studied the land grab university article that came out two and a half years ago in high country news. And so they decided to do um, implement a research project researching um, the history of the University of Minnesota's relationship with indigenous nations. Now, of course, like this, this approach like completely erases Dakota people who were removed and, you know, who are actually like, I think now reside in like Crow Creek and in other um, reservations that are now in the current state of South Dakota, and they have not been as included in the project. And so, you know, that's something that probably should be rectified in the future. But I listened to like after the session that was being led by these powerful um, grassroots black women who are leading and organizing the longest protest in US history. <laughs> so what's happening in Minneapolis, it's like just because the conflagration died down does not mean the protest has ended. And this was one of their important messages. And they're like, so what are you going to continue to do to like support this movement that values, right? And really liberates black life. Um, and so obviously for most people who know anything about the recent history of where I now live, like that is a very important, like one of the most important struggles, I think in the history of struggle in the United States. And that's here, right? The epicenter, it started here and it's still ongoing. And so right, right as soon as I ended that session, then I went into the Truth Commission session with these indigenous women who've been researching this history. And let me tell you, like, the University of Minnesota is the Death Star. Um, it's now my employer. And I'm like, every day, every day, I'm like, I can't believe I work here. Um, it makes me want to leave the academy more so, much more so than the University of New Mexico or the University of California Riverside ever did, because... The University of Minnesota benefit, so the, uh, gosh, I don't know the history entirely, but the Dakota and the Anishinaabeg lands that are now within the current state boundaries of Minnesota, 
the treaties of 1851 and 1862 um, that were, right, so these treaties were, they're quote unquote treaties, but essentially they were agreements that, that were struck and designed by architects of genocide and specifically, really specifically Dakota genocide, the hanging of the Dakota 38 and Manhato, Man Mankato, it's like the white version, um, which is right down the road where um, Minnesota State University is. Um, and then like the fort, the starvation, the, um, the imprisonment, and then like the death marching of Dakota people, um, their, their very forceful removal from these homelands. Like all of that happened. Some of the founding regents board from the, for the board of regents for the university of Minnesota were like very much engaged in the genocidal campaigns specifically against Dakota people because they wanted, because Dakota people were incredibly successful for a long period of time of resisting, like the settlement. Um, they were, you know, they won, they were winning certain battles, like their resistance was very powerful. And so within six weeks, I think after um, Dakota people were removed, and political and spiritual leaders were assassinated by President Lincoln, in collaboration with these men, people like George Sibley, and what's his face, Ramsey, these powerful Robin robber barons, basically of, of Minnesota at that time. Uh, six weeks after Dakota removal, um, these these gentlemen, many of whom were the founding board, were the founding regents of the University of Minnesota, grabbed all of that land. It was the largest land, um, it was the largest theft of indigenous land through treaty um, in the US. If I, I, I could be wrong, but I think that's correct. And the University of Minnesota was the largest beneficiary of that land. And so land grant institutions, New Mexico State University is a land grant institutions. Essentially what that means is that through the Morrill Act um, and through these acts of seizing land, the university was able to develop that land or sell that land or chop it into pieces and sell it off as private property to settlers, right? Um, and from the money that they have gained from the land that they acquired through genocide, um, Dakota genocide, we're basically able to build the very first endowment um, for the institution. And it's called the permanent puff, permanent something fund, public something puff, something fund, which is basically an endowment for the university. And that endowment continues to grow. Um, they've been able to invest money from that endowment into other endeavors. And so I think like it, they haven't quite calculated it yet, but the University of Minnesota has made billions, billions of dollars off of the Gen Dakota genocide primarily, but also like the removal and the theft of Anishinaabe or Ojibwe land. Um, and like, I didn't know that the anthropologist who was the primary architect of blood quantum as an early genocidal and um, eugenics uh, project of assimilation or method of assimilation was actually a University of Minnesota professor um, as well. And that also, like the University of Minnesota through its use of PUF funds has been able to like fund other kinds of like deeply anti-Indian projects in other places and places like Massachusetts. Um, and the, the land that was seized through land grants, um, Dakota and Anishinaabe land in what is now Minnesota fed Cornell University. Um, and I think it fed like about a dozen other universities, most of which were in the East and the South um, in what is now the United States. And so like when I call the University of Minnesota the Death Star, it's because the reach is is truly national, um, and like what the university has done with the the money it's made off of the theft of this land, and like the ethnic cleansing of Dakota people is like astounding. So like my office and the American Indian Studies Department are we have like the worst offices on campus. We like literally do. We're like in the worst building, on the worst floor. It's like a fucking haunted boarding school from the 40s is what our building feels like. And it's in what I feel like is probably one of the oldest parts of campus. It's this like fancy old red brick, brick building. And every time I have to go into this building, I'm just like, these bricks were literally built out of the blood of Dakota people. Quite literally, the foundation of this university was genocide. Quite literally, the money that built that brick and those settlers probably who laid that brick you know, and the people who would, ha I don't know how brick is made, but like using the land and the earth and baking it into that brick. And like, that's the foundation of the building I now have to be in. 
as an indigenous faculty member, it's like so disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I so anyway, I know I just went on for a really long time about this, but it's incredibly it is very important to understand like that the truth commission, right? And that the indigenous nations and that these women who are really in the front lines, they're in archives every day like researching this stuff. They're finding like these hidden eugenics projects that University of Minnesota scientists used to conduct on like indigenous children from Red Lake, for example, one of the young women um, who was talking was from Red Lake. And she was like, yeah, they removed kidneys from all of these children. And so there are also uh, thousands of indigenous remains that are still within the inventory and the possession of the University of Minnesota, um, like there are with many universities across the United States. And so there's this active effort being undertaken by people within the institution to abide by NAGPRA, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, to, you know, rematriate those remains and those relatives back to the community so they can be handled correctly and laid to rest. Um, and so, yeah, so this is just something that I've been thinking a lot about and like wondering why I've been feeling this way <laughs> since I got to this place, because I've just, I've been having this feeling and I'm like, what the fuck, like white supremacy, this is the other aspect of Minnesota, right? And this is, it helps to understand like why, why things had to be burned down in order for anyone to pay attention to like the extreme violence and of, of anti-blackness in this place. Granted, a lot of those fires were started by white supremacists who were posing as Antifa. So that's important <laughs> to, to pay attention to. But nevertheless, there is such like, liberalism here is such that like the University of Minnesota, for example, in relationship to the Truth Commission, it is very important for liberals, specifically white liberals here. I'm not even going to talk about the fascists and the white supremacists outside of the Twin Cities um, is mostly red. It's like very conservative, like the, the Kyle Rittenhouse kind of people. I mean, Kyle Rittenhouse is right across the border in Wisconsin, right? Kyle Rittenhouse who murdered um, those activists um, during the uprising of 2020, but the Kyle Rittenhouses of like the Midwest, they're all over the state of Minnesota as well. And they were descending upon the city during the 2020 uprising and like terrorizing neighborhoods, um, the, Amer the, the American Indian neighborhood called Phillips and the black neighborhoods, um, especially close to 38th in Chicago, which is, was like the, the epicenter of the uprising. And so it's important to know that there's like a very intense fascist white supremacy presence in Minnesota but there's also like the white liberal of Minnesota, most of whom live in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And they are very, very invested in the like uh, presenting themselves or the image of being in solidarity. Um, it's a very vacuous and a very shallow and therefore a very dangerous type of like liberalism that is through its mouth is talking about like diversity, equity, and inclusion, this like commitment to multiculturalism. So you'll go into like the wealthy white liberal neighborhoods in South and Southwest Minneapolis. And everyone has like the thing, the signs on their, like they're, they have the signs about like water's life, black lives matter, love is love, you know, those things. But like the lawn that they have that sign on is the lawn in front of a mansion, you know, a mansion, like a well manicured mansion. And so, but they drive a Tesla. But they drive a Tesla, you know, and they probably have like peaceful coexistence bumper stickers, you know, on their Tesla or whatever. Those things too, with like the peace sign in it. You know what I'm, mm -hmm. you know, coexist, you know what uh -huh. I'm talking about. Oh, yes. So I'm sorry I'm being so long-winded. It's just like this week was a particular like flashpoint for me when it comes to all of this. And so those white liberal, that, that, white, that type of white supremacy that's refracted through liberalism here is more powerful than any place I have ever lived. Certainly New Mexico isn't like this. It's probably just because there's a shit ton of brown people, actually, and it's a very poor state. Minnesota is not, is not demographically the same as New Mexico. New Mexico is like on the periphery of empire. The Twin Cities is like the center of empire. And it's because of the white supremacy in the rural parts, but it's because of the white liberals here who are deeply invested in the image, the public image, of being down with diversity, but are with that Minnesota nice kind of attitude, but are like so fucking racist. <laughs> and so they present in a certain way, 
but they will like do anything to stop, to malign, to discredit, and to delegitimize like black liberation in this place and indigenous liberation in this place. And so struggle here is so repressed and suppressed. It's like having being in a straight jacket or something. It's like you can see what's going on and you're screaming, but you're like in a padded room. It's really creepy. This place is disgusting. And the erasure, the like just the willful erasure of genocide, the genocide of like black folks and the genocide of indigenous folks, specifically Dakota people. The fact that 27 or 28% of native people in Minnesota live in poverty the fact that like you see all the only people you see panhandling in Minneapolis are indigenous and black people. The only people you see mm -hmm. to be homeless in your own homelands, like that is this place. <laughs> and I work at a university that has a lot of power, has a lot of power and has gained that power and that wealth quite literally off of genocide. And so New Mexico, you know, can be very white supremacist in Arizona, but this place, especially the Twin Cities, it's extremely racist. And like the whiteness here, like maintains its comfort through like the suppression of any kind of alternative or any kind of like pushback, right? A liberatory struggle, even to call out that whiteness here. It's so quickly either crushed because of like the, the conservative right wing aspects or it's crushed by that those liberal liberal overtures the university of minnesota cracks really quickly when you push a little bit harder and it'll give concessions because the liberalism here if there's like a, a rupture in that because of a challenge it will quickly like reclose the rupture it'll quickly reclose it it'll sew it right back up and maintain that like smooth universalist narrative of like diversity equity and inclusion and meanwhile like Police are still killing young black men on a regular basis here, right? Like indigenous people are still living in encampments outside, even though it's like very cold here now, like the transition to winter happened. And so all I'm saying is that like Minnesota's a, it's like a new hell. <laughs> it's like the hell mouth of like white supremacy and settler colonialism. But, you know, it's also like a place where women, especially, these black women and these indigenous women I got to listen to just fight. They fight so hard. And they're like, we're never going to stop fighting until our people are free. And, you know, given like the fact that Wakanda forever gives a vision of black and indigenous relationality that is actually deeply pessimistic and just fuck it, just fucked up. It's bad. It's bad. And to think about like what I heard about from black and indigenous feminists, essentially, about what that relationality could look like and does actually look like in practice on the ground here in places like George Floyd Memorial Square or like in these spaces where these these women are doing research um, on the history of genocide in the area compared to like this vision of what that looks like that's being broadcast to the world through Wakanda forever. It was just like, it was just a week of extreme, of extremes, but it, I don't know, it really like brought me back to why we do this work and like why we need to listen to black women and we need to listen to indigenous women period the session that i went to was called listen to black women i was like okay yeah hell yeah sorry that was really long <laughs> it's just been like on my mind <laughs> no it, it 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 actually i mean i i have not spent an awful lot of time in that part of the world minneapolis st paul um but i i was up there and it has to be 20 20 years ago, doing a lecture at the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and flew into Minneapolis and was picked up by someone in the Native American Studies Department from the university and um, pulled on campus and parked. And there was a car in the parking lot that had a bumper sticker on it that said, Save a whitefish spear an Indian. What the fuck? <laughs> and yeah. And so this young 
guy, I think it was a guy, yeah, who had driven me from the airport. And I, I stopped and I said, what is this? What does this mean? Like, what? What the absolute fuck? And he said that the native people were the only ones who were allowed to spearfish in this particular river, which was near the university. And it's because they had, um, you know, some sort of treaty rights to spearfish mm -hmm. in this river. And the local sportsmen were angry because they thought that the native people were going to spear all the fish. And so this person had this bumper sticker on a university campus and I was so appalled and I said, well, you know, if you had this, something like this on your car at the university of New Mexico, someone would bomb your car. Like your car would be blown up. This would not be allowed because of the number of, of native students, you know, and 20 years ago, there weren't as many as there are now and certainly weren't as many, um, faculty, um, native faculty, but, but I honestly, and, and okay. So maybe 20 years ago, I was a little more naive than I am now, but I couldn't, I could not believe that bumper sticker on a car in a university in the middle of native land. It just blew my mind. Wait, what year was this again? Um, I can pinpoint it by, it was the, it was, I was in Wisconsin, the year, the the exact week that Columbine happened in Colorado. Okay, so 1999? Yeah. Yeah, that right there, that description you just gave, hell yeah. That's like Wisconsin and Minnesota, where it is like, where the whiteness is very powerful. It is very powerful um, in these places in a way that it is not in New Mexico. Whiteness is not nearly as powerful in New yeah. Mexico and that it is like, it is incredibly permissive, right? And that white folks give each other permission in these kinds of locations to be this way. So some of them are just like openly racist, but everyone's racist. And the ones who aren't openly racist, they just like feel safe with each other. I cannot tell you, this has happened to me four times in conversations with people from the Twin Cities, some of whom are white, some of whom are white passing native people. I have, it's, I've never heard anyone say this before. People don't say this in New Mexico. They're like, it's incredible. Like the liberals here, when they think that you're white and they feel safe, the things that they will say about like migrants and black folks and indigenous folks, because they think they're in a safe space for whiteness. And they're like, the things that I have been privy to because this person presumed because I was white or they thought I was white, that they could actually say what they really mean, you know? And like, and then they could have those signs on their lawns. That's what this place is like. It's like, get out. <laughs> Honestly, it's an, it's like a horror. Sh it's like a nightmare. It's like a living nightmare here. And so what you're describing about Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. That is what it's like being, I don't know, like indigenous here. It's what it is like being black here. And so it's a, it's a new hell, you know, it's a different hellscape than New Mexico, but I feel like this week was like really when I finally put the, I was like, I feel this way. And I've been developing this analysis. I've been doing a lot of reading and like paying attention to like local politics and trying to be like, what the fuck? Like, what, what is this? And I feel like for me, this week was really like the pieces finally came together. And so now that I understand it, you know? I'm just like, okay, now I can figure out like how to help, you know, where, where can I, as like an indigenous person who is not from this place, but I now I'm employed by this fucking institution. Oh God. Oh, I just, it just makes, I don't know. Just being here. It's just like, I just feel dirty every day. It's like, I have to like scrub this place off of my body when I get home. I'm not kidding. Like, that's how bad it is. I never felt that way in New Mexico. And so it's like a, it's a unique hell. <laughs> I, I understand. I mean, I, I, every, to me, every university has 
these evils in the basement. Ugh. If it's um, and when you said when you said it was an anthropologist who developed the blood quantum um, idea, whatever. Um, I just I'm I but uh, yeah, of course it was. I'm sorry, but yes, of course it was an. Of course, it was an anthropologist. And yeah, of course, of course, and and I I um so you know when when I was young my father was at Princeton and so I spent like the first six years of my life in New Jersey and we would come back to New Mexico every summer um and um you know stay um with family at Oque Wingue or or in Española or somewhere um and then my father left there um and we moved to Santa Fe but um I have distinct memories of, and of course my mother was from Boston. So, um, Harvard, Princeton, the Ivy leagues, and all of these institutions, um, you know, built on stolen land to educate, um, colonizers and to educate elite colonizers. So these are the epitome of, um, I mean, this is what the United States is, is, are these universities and that they reflect the values of this country um, is like, yeah, duh. You know, I, I can't even tell you some of the people from particularly Princeton, because my father had a lot of friends or colleagues from there that I still keep in touch with. And sometimes the things that they say Uh um, are, are so horrific that I, I mean, cultural, commodification, cannibalism, you know, the cultural cannibalism, the entitlement that of course the university has a right to these things. No, you fucking don't like you really don't. Um, and NAGPRA was designed to sort of try to, you know, fix some of that. And yet the pain, like we were talking earlier about, um, Harvard University, the Peabody <laughs> Museum, has hair from children from the boarding schools. Just the idea of that, or just the thought, you know, of of our young people being in those schools, having their hair cut off, and then someone from Harvard gathering that hair up and keeping it as as something to be studied or to keep i don't know were they going to display it i mean the whole thing is so horrific grotesque. it's grotesque and it's just painful like i just can't i just can't imagine being in the basements of some of these universities, mm-hmm. you know, the museums and, you know, our, our ancestors bones are there, not only our ancestors bones, but our, you know, the children's hair and the, and the, the, the sacred objects that were, were taken and the, um, you know, the, the ancestors used, you know, these items in ceremony and they were, t- I, I mean, to me, it's like, it's like, um, it is. It's like a horror movie. It's like being in, it's like poltergeist when all those bones start coming up when they're digging the swimming pool. Mm. And I mean, that's that whole, the whole, the thought of it just is, is repulsive and, and scary. And yet every single university has this. Yeah. You know, like in horror movies, it's like the greatest nightmare of a white settler is to be to have their home built on an Indian graveyard, right? And so it's like, that's why they're uncomfortable in their home or they're like being haunted. And sometimes, okay, full disclosure, (laughs) something I don't talk about. Sometimes I watch like paranormal reality shows. (laughs) And I... I find them very fascinating, like politically, because 
Right. We talked about this so many times on the podcast that like the Indian cemetery trope in American, like mostly white written, mostly by men, actually horror, horror shows, whether it's TV or film. And like the Indian graveyard is always like this, the burial ground, sorry, the burial ground. It's the Indian burial ground is always really central. And so I sometimes often in like these paranormal reality shows that are like series, right? They're serial shows. And so each episode is like a different story. Like you find out that there's usually like two types of hauntings or something. I mean, it's often demonic or whatever that means that's happening. But often it's like an old, it's like a white man who owned that property in the past, who's usually like a misogynist. He like, he hated women, you know, when he was alive and even in death, he still performs and maintains like that settler man, male ontology, where he just wants to own everything. And so the people who are living there, like present day people, he just fucking like terrorizes them from the dead, you know, because even in death, he still owns women and he still owns the land. And he really loved the fact that he killed Indians, you know, like seriously, that's like a huge like tr- theme in like paranormal reality shows. But also the theme of like the Indian burial ground, you'll often hear like it's usually like white families that that they investigate. It's usually like white investigators who are going to help out like white families or like in white owned spaces where there might be hauntings or like, you know, paranormal activity. And like, I'd say like half the time, if not more, like when they're interviewing the person who owns the house or the building or the property that they think is haunted, they'll speculate. They'll be like, um, you know, sometimes I think that maybe this place is built on top of an Indian burial ground. And like, that's why this is happening. And then universities like are literal, literally, like literally built out of the bones and like the blood of our ancestors. Harvard also released that report on the ways in which slavery really built that institution. But that report came out earlier this year. I forgot what it's called. I apologize. But it's like quite literally like, I mean, what is this? uh, What is, what is the trigger warning? Um, Quite literally like American universities, especially the kinds of the elitism that the university of Minnesota and Harvard fashion themselves to be, they're quite literally built on the bones and the blood of like indigenous and black ancestors. And it's like, um, I don't, you know, like we say sometimes, like you can't unbake that cake. I just don't, I don't know how to decolonize these institutions. I really don't. There's, I, I, I don't know what to do about it. Did they burn? Well, their purpose is to perpetuate um, the, the settler colonial state um, and the, and everything that created it. So perpetuate the, the genocide, perpetuate the um, erasure. And there's, I mean, you can't, you literally can't decolonize them. They will have to be burned to the ground. Or just abandoned. Yeah. You know, they'll just have to be left because the land is bad. Cause like, um, it's like, you can't come back from it, I guess is. And this is a strange thing to say, because I like, I work within these spaces and in these institutions I I don't know. I get my paycheck from these institutions, but increasingly like, you know, I'm in American Indian studies, which the institution doesn't give a shit about anyway, and gives no resources to like, seriously, my office is, it looks like it hasn't been renovated since the 1940s. And like, it's, it's, it's actually depressing and awful and creepy. I think the floor is haunted. It feels like the pictures you see of dilapidated boarding schools, Uh, seriously, that the floor where most of the, the, the faculty Um, all of whom are indigenous in American Indian studies here. That's where we're housed. And so, you know, the university doesn't give a shit about American Indian studies, but I come from a native studies program at UNM that is so beautiful and powerful because even though it understands that it's like within the university, it is not really interested in like responding to the university. That program, and especially the way that my colleagues were able to develop the master's and the PhD is really invested and embedded in community. It's about having relationships with our nations, right? Our relevance is to like what is outside of the institution. It's not to the institution. And so I think the only way I can survive um, continuing to work at a university is within a native studies space that does see itself, you know, 
it's it's community is outside of the institution. And then yeah. we're supporting the native students inside the institution. Because if I'm feeling this way as like a very informed, like a much older native person, can you imagine how like 18 year old native students from like a reservation feel coming yeah. into these spaces? Um, and that's the other thing is at Harvard, my, so my sister, one of my sisters works at Harvard. Um, she works for the Harvard program for um, the Honoring Nations program for economic development. And um, she has been kind of telling us before the news broke, she was uh, telling me and my other sister that this was happening with the, like the discovery of this hair of the, was it 500 samples, 700? Um, I guess they're not samples. They're just like pe the collection of hair, right? Like anyways, like a Navajo person is like blasphemous. It's like evil to do that, to take someone's hair. Uh, and in general, it's just evil to take someone's hair. Um, 98 of the, there are names of individuals attached to most of the specimens or the samples. Ugh. Uh, that 98 of those surnames matched the surnames of native people who are actually at Harvard right now. This is what's okay. Right. This is like so unbelievably disgusting. And so the indigenous people, whether it's faculty, staff, or students who are actually like at Harvard, like Harvard had to call those people into meetings, including my sister, because one of the people whose hair is in that collection has a last name, Yazi, and is from a community very close to where my clan is from on the Western side of Navajo. My sister was one of the 98 people, native people, who was called into a meeting to possibly like help them identify <laughs> that person. And I'm like, are, are you fucking kidding me? Like 98 people who are at your institution might possibly be the descendants of these people or like the relatives of these people who you've like held in, in a closet, like in a cage. And that were like, probably without their consent. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of those were children. Yep. At boarding schools whose hair was in that, are in that collection. And so it's like, I, I, you know, it's just like the level of violence, the violence of finding out that this collection of hair exists in the first place. And then the violence of realizing that you have people, actual alive native people in your institution who match the surnames of 98% of those hair, 98 of those, not percent, but 98 of those hair samples, which is about 20% of the, the, the sample of the, the collection itself. And then, I mean, I, Harvard was trying to figure out, like, I guess it was at the, the, the bequest or the, the, the request, the, um, the request of some native people that Harvard meet with these 98 individuals, but I also am not really sure that that's the best thing. Cause it's like, you, you're like, you're inflicting a lot of violence on these yeah. native people who are actually at your institution right now by asking them to sit down in these meetings to be like, Oh, I think this hair belonged to like your auntie. And you know, <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And anyway, that's what's been going on at Harvard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Uh huh. And, yeah, and like, uh, pop, pop, hair, pop. hair is one of those things. And um, we, in fact, we had a conversation about hair not too long ago, because those of us who were raised, um, well, in the pueblos, we have the same. Um, I don't want to say superstition, but the same feeling. Things like fingernails and hair. Yeah you don't leave behind. So when you're a child and your mother or father is cutting your hair, they sweep it all up and it's disposed of. Yeah. And in a particular you, way, in a particular way, you don't ever leave it behind. And like, even now as a, as a grown up, and by my, with my own kids who are in their twenties now, it's like, Nope, you do not leave those fingernails in the sink. Please dispose of them properly and so the, the idea that they kept this hair and then they, oh, let's get all the native people to come in and see if they can help us figure out what to do with it. Just double, double whammy there. Very, very 
scary. It's like you have to get a ceremony done after that. Yeah. Like you, you, like you shouldn't even be looking at it. Like it shouldn't. Nope. Like uh, you know, like you can't really be doing those kinds of things, and they do. Like I, I myself have been told, and have had, like certain ceremonial things performed as I have to go in and do research in archives, because even written words can affect you in a certain way, let alone body parts, like coming into contact with certain items, you know, as somebody who researches, like I'm very concerned for these indigenous women doing the archival research for the truth project. I was like, are, are you protected? Are you protecting yourself? Cause like, this is dangerous work. It really affects you. The violence really affects you. Mm -hmm. And that yep. is the Academy. <laughs> that is the Academy. So that's America. Like, yeah. Oh, gosh. And then uh, ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act, being seen in um, SCOTUS this week. Given everything that we've already talked about, I, you know, have not listened to the the Brakeen, Brakeen's lawyer uh, making their opening arguments, I guess, is what happened this week. I don't know what happened this week. I know a lot of people listened to it. I just couldn't. I was already, I don't know. I was already just like, fuck, man. I don't think I can handle any more like uh, just belligerent, open racism and violence against indigenous people. <laughs> like, I just can't handle it. Can't handle any more. So I didn't listen to it. But that happened this week. I didn't listen to it either, but I did see comments from um, comrades, um, particularly those with law degrees, um, who were making comments on social media about it. And um, just the ignorance of, you know, the highest court in the land has absolutely no clue about Indian law and making comparisons that are ridiculous to anyone who understands anything about Indian law. And um, I, I did read something in mainstream press that it does appear that, and this was uh, on the AP, so I don't know who wrote it, but um, it does appear as though the justices are leaning towards um upholding ICWA. So if they, if that is true and I'm not knocking on wood here, if that is true, then it will be the first good news that we've had out of the Supreme court. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that's another, you know, that's another horrific, uh, you know, that ICWA was designed for a reason. And the fact that they're even thinking about abolishing it just talk about having the rug pulled out from under you. I mean, ICWA was fought for in the seventies in response to the, the theft of children from our families and from our communities, which is a still a widespread practice. I'm going to repeat this again. Jaskier and Dylan talks about this in Prairie Rising. She writes about the Canadian context, but in Canada today, there are more First Nations children in custody of the state today than there were at the height of residential schools in Canada. And this is happening primarily through foster care and through adoption. Like the state will often seize possession of an indigenous infant the moment it's born if the mother is deemed to be unfit, maybe if she has a criminal record, right? And so even though that is Canada, that should paint a very clear picture of like how systematic the theft of our future is, how well, well oiled this machine is in places like Canada and the United States and how hard, just like, why the fuck would you have to fight so hard just to be able to have some self-determination over the placement of the children that are actually going to be the, the future of your nation, mm -hmm. you know, and even that is up for question. And it's, uh, it, there are no words. There's actually, there are no words for it. 
there are no words for it and it it just <clears throat> um you know it happened to my father and we uh, we don't talk much about this even in my family um but but uh my my father's mother so my grandmother um had a breakdown when he was born he has two older sisters and she had a breakdown um and he was taken away from the family and he lived his first year of life in the Santa Fe Indian Hospital and I didn't know not, that not many people do know that um hmm. my so my two aunts um were living with my with their grandmother, my great grandmother, and she wanted my father, but because she was blind at the time, um, she was blind for most of her adult life. Um, and she already had two kids and, um, my grandfather at that point was an active alcoholic. Um, they wouldn't give my dad to her. So the first year of his life, he was at the Santa Fe Indian Hospital and he went, um, she finally got legal custody. His grandmother mm -hmm. finally got legal custody of him and he was re returned to Okewinge, um, where she raised him. And then, you know, six, seven years later, they came and took him to boarding school. Um, so twice removed. <sighs> Ugh. And these are, these are, these are, these are not uncommon stories. Yeah. Totally. Um, and, you know, when you had women and, you know, the, the maternal um, death rate was very high, particularly among some communities um, due to lack of medical care and, you know, everything, uh, not enough food, yeah. um, not enough heating. And they would take the, the, if the if the mother died during childbirth, they would remove the child without even talking to the families, and you know without even seeing like is there someone? And obviously, most of the time there would be someone who would take this child. So it, it it's just another form of genocide. Um, and I mean, it's and actually it was, a form of genocide according to the yeah. United Nations. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and so if you if you if you look at at the fact that the Supreme Court is even debating this, like what, what state was it, Alabama, um, that just voted to outlaw slavery? Um, <sighs> and, and it, it won by, I don't know, 80%. Um, it, it, it passed the law passed. It was a state election, a state, um, law. and, and so, okay, it passed. So they outlawed slavery. It passed by 80%. Who were the 20% that thought that slavery was a good plan? I mean, that to be that's, that's appalling, but the uh. idea, but that's the same with ICWA. Like how could you perpetuate genocide by even considering striking this down? And I mean, it's incredibly painful that it, this even has to be heard. This even has to be, especially heard by this, this SCOTUS. Um, but any SCOTUS, you know, that, that, that our rights to our own children, um, as, as human beings, as people, but also as communities is even being questioned today in 2022, I find horrific. I, I just don't, I, I mean, there are no words. I, yeah, there really aren't right. And the reduction which has always been the project of assimilation, the reduction of indigenous nations to racial minorities um, or indigeneity not being like a political um, category, right? But uh, a racial identity. That's really also what's at stake right now. Um, you know, the assertion that uh, indigenous peoples are nations, not minorities, which has always been a fundamental aspect um, that has been asserted over and over again by indigenous people, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, I think is something that's very much still, it's on trial, right? And it's like, <laughs> like this is, a po this is a policy, like assimilation became the official policy of like um, US approaches or attitudes towards Indians 
like around the time of the allotment era and the last part of the 19th century, the last half, which was like, like the most violent period of removal and wars and massacres and assassinations and dispossession, like huge. I don't, it was it like the largest amount of land was um, dispossessed from indigenous people during this period. Right. And then uh, was it in 1871 or was it 1851? I apologize that, uh, you know, that the, the uh, treaty making or like relationships with indigenous peoples. Well, treaty making was officially ended. And then the policy of assimilation basically began at that time. Um, and U.S. people were removed from the Department of War as like a foreign entity that the U.S. had to have nation to nation relationships with to where, you know, where it is now with the Department of the Interior um, as domestic and where their status as domestic dependent nations. And so. It, this is like a type of genocide that's been going on for with us like what about 150 years maybe a little over 150 years now and it's kind of like mind-boggling that even in the political climate of 2022 in the united states it's not 2022 it's fucking like 1871 yep. <laughs> let's be honest let's be fucking honest in this country and that's like you gotta it takes a it takes a minute to wrap your head around that. Like Indian hating native people, hating Indians is still perfectly acceptable in the United States. Like yep. fuck. What do you say? What do you say about that? I don't know what to say about that. I don't know what to say about it either. I, 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 the, I find this, this all so horrific and just sad and, and it makes me angry. It makes me sad. It makes me just want to like, you know, what the fuck is the matter with people? Um, and I know, and on the, you know, on the flip, so I have my own personal history with, with, with it and and my father in in when he was at Princeton helped write ICWA, um, and really, yep. Fuck. See the things the things we're learning about Elena Ortiz in this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, go your I, I, dad. Go Alfonso Ortiz, a hero of our people. You know, and Alfonso was, <laughs> you know, a lot of this stuff I didn't learn, you know, until. M- after he was gone, but yeah, he was, he was a low key activist, not, not, uh, you know, although he was on the today show one time, um, (laughs) talking, but he was one of the OG land back. And, um, you know, we, we don't want apologies. We want land back. Just give us land back. I mean, that was one of the first things that, that, uh, I learned about him, um, in his days at Princeton was, was like, he was out there talking about this to the fucking New York times and the today show and shit. And, uh, um, but, uh, I don't have any idea where this conversation was going because we got kind of sidetracked. No, um, this is great. <laughs> but, but, uh, I, I was, so I keep in touch with some of my father's old colleagues from, from Princeton and, um, uh, occasionally, um, they'll find things the the last thing I got was a big envelope of clippings, um, from newspapers from when my father was at Princeton and I was a small child. So I don't know, I didn't know any of this and it just came to me like last year. And there was a whole bunch of quotes from, from him in, in the local newspapers, you know, where he's actually talking about land back and, um, and native sovereignty and nation to nation and, and things like that. And, and it's, it's amazing to, um, you know, to realize that these struggles have gone on in every corner of Indian country, every corner of Turtle Island since the very beginning. And, and that we come from a long legacy of, um, resistance and a long legacy of um, fighting for sovereignty and fighting for um, indigenous liberation and fighting for our rights. And that, 
you know, we've been doing it and we'll continue to do it. And as disheartening as sometimes these weeks are and these months are and these years are, like we have no choice because our ancestors did not pass this down to us um, for us to lay it down and walk on. Like yep. we, we don't have a choice. We have to pick it up and we have to, we have to carry on with it. And, and no matter what we do, it's always going to be with us. And it's always going to be these, these voices in our ears that are saying, you know, land back um, and, and liberation and resistance and revolt and revolution. And it's what we were raised on next to, you know, next to our, our Quaker oats, we got the, you know, the, the revolution in our heads. Our cream of wheat. <laughs> our cream of wheat. Our cream of white. A cream of um, white. <laughs> white ass food. <laughs> but yeah. And, and, and like, there's like, I, I just don't, I don't feel like I have ever had a choice in my life and it's a good choice to have, but it's, it's also, you know, when, when you, like when I talk about my family and my father and, and, you know, that's my legacy too. And there, there isn't anyone that I know, any indigenous person that I know that hasn't had a similar story, a boarding school story or a relative that was in a boarding school, a relative that was taken, you know, like, I don't know a single native person that doesn't have that story. Yeah. And that's, and that's, that's, that's sad. It's really kind of overwhelming. Um, but on the other hand, it's why we're still here. Yeah. That's, I think, a good place to end for the episode. I, you know, listening to you, Elena, like you really are, you're like the daughter you know of an uh indigenous freedom fighter and you've like carried that struggle forward it's like why you're in the red nation you know and i don't necessarily come from that kind of lineage I just come from like a proly <laughs> native family but you're very i think you're very much like you represent the what we call like the traditions of indigenous resistance it's like an intergenerational you know, our history is the, the future kind of a understanding of indigenous resistance and indigenous liberation. And like you said, for all, oh, for all the sadness and the pain of this week, all of the silencing and the punishment that native people receive for resisting like the fishing rights struggle in Wisconsin, or like the willful ignorance um, that people, and not just white people, like continue to perpetuate and direct at us, people like you, you know, the fact that you exist and you show up for this podcast every two weeks, even though you're like very busy, you're a mom, you have lambs stew to eat, you know, you got, you got other <laughs> things to do. <laughs> you got some Puebla bread to cut into. Like it's a, and then listening, you know, to those, those powerful black women who are just holding it down. However many hundreds of days later, after May 25th of 2020, and these indigenous women who are just like going into archives every day to try to uncover this truth, like that's that's where life lives, right? Yep. That's where the future lives. And it it's important for us to like live there, even when we have to confront the fucking death world or the deathscape of white supremacy and settler colonialism. But yeah, like that's why, as Demetrius would say, our comrade Demetrius, that's why we play this game. And if you, if there's one, one final plug, if you all, um, listeners out there, um, are undecided about what to do for the upcoming Turkey day, the no thanks, no giving, um, United American Indians of New England run by a great comrade of ours, Matoin Monroe and, um, her daughter Keisha and, and son Kook, I'm sure is in there, um, also, they do um, the National Day of Mourning down in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and it's an event that I know M Melanie has gone to. I used to go every year um, for years, um, gathering of Native, Indigenous um, people from all over the world. Usually there's some Palestinians, um, 
people from um, Turtle Island, from the North, from the Global South, all gathering together and sharing um, news from their communities, news from their homelands, and um, and then sharing a meal. Um, and it's an amazing event. And it really is. If you can't go, send money. Um, Matoi and um, Keisha um, are doing a lot of this work dish themselves, and um, any uh, any donations would be grateful. We cool. Can, yeah. Cool. Um, well, thanks for that plug. I can give that plug too. It's an incredible event. Very like anti-colonial um, thing to do on what is otherwise just like a gross day. We're also in Native American Heritage Month. Like, who gives a fuck? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want a month. Want want land back. Want some. I want some liberation. We want some land back and some liberation, and we want the Supreme Court to just dissolve itself into a little puddle. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> why away. do you exist? You're like this undemocratic, uninformed institution of power. Like, fuck. <laughs> Seriously, we just must die. save American democracy. Whatever. No yeah, demo thing. democracy <laughs> built on like slavery and genocide. Really, mm -hmm. so something to save? It's not. No. Nope. But that said, um, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, wow, we talked for over an hour and a half. I thought this was going to be a short episode, but we we had a lot to say. I really, before I get off, I want to congratulate all of my fellow Diné women who were elected this week. <laughs> Never in the history of the Navajo Nation because of its fucking heteropatriarchy <laughs> attached to the formal institutions of governance have women had this much power, like, or just like, you know, like, just like they're just been recognized. <laughs> it's like being like adequate enough to have this kind of power. So now um, our vice president is a woman and I believe nine women were elected to the tribal council, which is 40%. Maybe 40% of the tribal council. This is a really big deal. It's a really big deal from a, for a very conservative form of nationalism that is often adhered to the racial, the gender, um, and like the sexual politics of U.S. nationalism. So congratulations to all of those who won. Congratulations. And to Navajo voters. Like, I am, yes. Finally. I'm so happy for my Navajo relatives and particularly the women on the Navajo nation that some of the power that has been stripped away by settler colonialism and the establishment of the heteropatriarchy is now coming back. And I'm just going to say one thing, which is watch out Pueblos. We're coming for you too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I mean, just cause you're a woman doesn't mean you have a good politics, good politics, right? I actually don't know the political record of a lot of these women, but nevertheless, it's still, it's still like a little, it's still a victory. It's still something I think worth celebrating um, that came out of this week. So thanks for listening, everyone. I apologize about my cat. She's my new kitty. She's bellowing during this episode. I, I'm so, I'm sorry. This, like, you, this hasn't happened before on Red Power Hour. It will happen pretty much every time I record in the future because she's brand new to me, but she's very talkative. And when I don't pay attention to her, like if I'm speaking into my microphone, here she'll be like why aren't you speaking to me and then she'll go somewhere else in the house and like just try to get my attention so you know this is the new reality <laughs> for, for me and for rph so yeah we'll see you all back in a couple of weeks we have to do a reservation dogs episode we have to do an episode on wakanda forever um and we might do some other episodes i'd like to do some in intense interviews with the truth commission writers and i would also like to invite um the women i heard from the Glo george floyd um, Global Memorial onto uh, the Red Nation podcast to do an interview and to elevate their work. So stay tuned for all of those different topics.